Our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 29. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. If you don't know her, that's our own Jessica Turk reading the scripture this week from her dorm room at the University of Texas. And uh, if you notice, Scott put her name in orange and white. I've asked him to refrain from doing that, as this is a holy place. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> no, I'm joking. I'm very grateful that she's willing to participate in our, in our worship. So let's pray as we open God's word. Lord, thank you for the chance we have to be together in this place. And whether we're here in the sanctuary or at home here in town or even out of town, far away, Connect us to you, connect us to each other, and connect us to your word. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, today in the Gospel of Luke, we come to one of the most well-known passages in the New Testament, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Last week, we heard Jesus talk about his true nature as the Son, who is known only by the Father. And this week, he'll show us an example of what faith in him looks like, lived out. His parable is a lasting picture of what Paul talked about in the book of Galatians. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So let's look at this familiar story and see what we can uncover about its meaning. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It can be difficult to assess the attitude of this expert in the law who questions Jesus. On one hand, he seems, he seems to show Jesus respect. For instance, he stood up. Students of a rabbi would sit around them while they learned and then stand up to speak or to ask a question as a sign of honor. He also calls Jesus teacher or rabbi, which is another sign of respect. And he was someone who had devoted a significant part of his life to the study of Jewish law. So he was obviously a spiritually minded person. However, Luke tells us that he seems to have had a somewhat less than honorable intention. He says that this man stood up to test Jesus. What does that mean? There were times when people intentionally tried to trap Jesus in his words to get him to say something that would create controversy with the authorities or with the people in general. But this doesn't seem to be that. Instead, this man seems to be trying to find out if Jesus and his ideas about God will fit with his own. He's developed a certain way of understanding God, relating to God, and he wants to know if Jesus' ideas are the same as his. If so, great. They can get along. If not, if Jesus has different ideas, there might be a problem. So let me just spoil the suspense for you. Jesus is going to have different ideas. And that's not just true for this man. It's true for all of us. Jesus will always be different from us. No matter how much we love God, how much we think we've learned and grown spiritually, Jesus will always call us to go further to love more, to sacrifice more, to change more. In some ways, Jesus' spirituality will be stricter, more conservative than ours. In other ways, it will be more open, more liberal, to use our word. And again, that's true for every single one of us. In some ways, Jesus is more conservative than the most conservative among us. And he's more liberal than the most liberal. Jesus is himself. There's no one else like him. That's why we can never give our total allegiance to any human institution, to any human set of ideas, even our own. Following Jesus means our total allegiance is only to him. And he will change 
every human institution that lets him in. He will change every human being that decides to be his follower. So if any of us are thinking, you know, maybe my way of being or my party or my group or my friends, maybe our way of thinking just happens to be the same as Jesus. Again, I'll spoil the suspense. It isn't. Following Jesus will always mean change for every single one of us. This man who questioned Jesus is in for a surprise. He's going to hear something completely new to him and very different than what he currently thinks. The question is, how will he respond? What was his original question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's not a bad question. God wants to give us life, real life, eternal life. And there's nothing wrong with us wanting to have it. This man is not the only person who ever asked Jesus this question. And when Jesus answers, at first, everything seems to be going along the lines that this man expected. Jesus responds by referring to the law, something this man knows a lot about, and he asks for his perspective. Verse 26, what is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. It strikes me that most of our theological controversies are usually about peripheral issues. But when it comes to the basics, how we should relate to God and to each other, what sort of life God calls us to live, we know the answer to that. Love God with our whole selves and love each other the same way. By the way, the word for love here in the first and second commands, there's only one word. You may know that in Greek there are multiple words for love, which each have different qualities and things like that. But these two commands use the highest, most expansive word for love, which is agape. Agape love is complete, undying, and forever. It's the love that God has for us. So in the formula for righteousness that Jesus approves, it's not just our love for God that is to be agape, but also our love for each other. In other words, this guy just said a mouthful, maybe more than he really knows. Love God and your neighbor with a total, all-encompassing, self-giving love. Jesus says, do this and you will live. It's not about knowing it or quoting it. It's about living it. Now, here's where we see a little deeper into this man's possible motives. He's very knowledgeable. How many other people could have answered Jesus' question so well? His answer is almost word for word the way that Jesus would sum up the law and the prophets in some other places. He's definitely on the right track. He knows, it seems, what God wants. But then, verse 29... But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Is he coming to Jesus with an honest question to better learn the will of God so that he can do it? Apparently not. Apparently what he really wants is to justify himself. What does that mean? There's a basic choice that we all have to make over and over again in our life of following Christ. Am I going to adjust myself, my thoughts and my actions to fit with what Jesus says? Or am I gonna adjust my understanding of what Jesus says to fit with my thoughts and my actions? There's gonna have to be an adjustment somewhere. We've already established that. So who will change to fit whom? Will I change to fit with Jesus? Or will I attempt to change Jesus, or at least my understanding of Jesus, in order to fit with me. As you can tell, it's a very important decision. And this man seems to be starting out with plan B. He wants to justify himself. He wants to find a way to stay how he is and have that be okay with God. So this idea of loving my neighbor as myself, this total self-giving kind of love I'm supposed to live out for all people, exactly which people are we talking about? What is he hoping for? 
he wants to establish some exceptions to the rule. I mean, sure, I'll definitely love some people, but there are other people I don't think should count. So when God says neighbor, who all's included? This expert in the law is trying to create a legal definition of neighbor, preferably one that includes only the people that I already love. That would be the easiest way to do it. I like this painting where the man is questioning Jesus. The man leans forward with his hand gesturing like he's about to tick off on his fingers the kind of people who shouldn't qualify as neighbor. And Jesus looks very thoughtful. This guy is not all bad, not by any means. He studied God's word, even memorized it. And he seems to have a genuine desire to please God, to love. He just doesn't really know what love is yet, what it will mean. So how can Jesus show him in a way that lets him see the vast gulf between his definition of love and God's definition? So Jesus decides, as he often does, to tell a story. Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. The setting of Jesus' story would have been familiar to his listeners. Everyone in the area knew the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, which descended more than 3,000 feet in elevation down through the hill country, which was filled with caves. Just the perfect place for highway robbers. In fact, as the story begins, I imagine some of the people thought to themselves, this guy's traveling alone on that road? Not smart. And sure enough, he gets mugged, and left for dead. And then some other travelers come along, a priest and a Levite, two people who are directly connected with temple worship. The point is, these are good people, respectable people, spiritual people. In fact, they're very similar to the man who asked the question that gave rise to this parable in the first place. But they don't help the injured man. And truthfully, we can probably think of a lot of good reasons why they wouldn't. Here is the perfect example by the side of the road of just how dangerous this road is. In fact, what if it's a trick? What if he's only pretending to be hurt to get me to go over there and then I get jumped on and attacked and whatever? So all things considered, it's probably better just to mind our own business and keep on going. Now, most stories have a structure to them and sometimes the structure is easy to predict. There have already been two people who came by, both important religious people, so it's kind of easy to see where Jesus is probably going. The third person to come by, apparently the rule of three has been around for a long time, this third person is going to be the hero. And since the first two were important religious types, it's obvious who the hero is going to be. It's going to be a regular person. And the point is going to be, it's not about being a specially sanctified Jew, it's just about being a regular faithful Jew. That's not where Jesus is going. And that's not the point. Instead, Jesus chooses the last person that anyone would expect to be a role model. A Samaritan. Now that doesn't mean much to us, but it meant a lot back then. The people of Judea had a shared history with the Samaritans in the very distant past. But in the intervening centuries, Samaria had undergone quite a few changes. They had been influenced heavily by the outside world. People from Babylon and Macedonia, in other words, Gentiles, had moved in and intermarried with the people of Samaria. They even had a rival temple. Instead of worshiping at Jerusalem, they worshiped on Mount Gerizim in their own rival temple. So as far as the Judeans were concerned, Samaritans were racially, spiritually, politically, and culturally outcast. Remember in the last chapter here in Luke when James and John got upset because they thought some Samaritans had disrespected Jesus? What did they say? Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Jesus rebuked them, but they thought of that 
pretty fast. It escalated quick in their mind. In John 8, some of Jesus' opponents are upset with him and they want to slander him. So they say, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? In their minds, it wasn't far from one to the other. For Judeans, the Samaritans were completely other. And that's who Jesus chose to make the hero of the story. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Hearing the first part of the story, even if we were expecting a twist, we wouldn't have expected this. Maybe if Jesus really wanted to go out on a limb, we might have thought he would have the main character be a Jewish person who helped an outcast. After all, Jesus was in the habit of doing that. But to have the main character, the hero of the story, be the outcast who helped someone like us, what is he saying? Jesus has reframed the issue. The original question was, who is my neighbor? In other words, what are the limits that I can put around my love? But Jesus shows us a picture of selfless love with no boundaries and then ask us a question. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Leave it to Jesus to turn the tables on us. It's not who do you think you can manage to love, Instead, the real question is, if you were in another's place, even a person you can't understand at all, a person you disagree with completely, who you have absolutely nothing in common with, a person who is completely other to you, if you were in their place, who would you hope would show love to you? When we see what the Samaritan did, even if we hate Samaritans, we have to admit what he did was right. He's the one in the story who looks like God. You can tell the man talking with Jesus can't bring himself to even say the word Samaritan. So he just answers, the one who had mercy on him. But even he can see that's love. Not quibbling about defining a neighbor, but being a neighbor. Showing mercy and kindness wherever it's needed. So now that we've heard this story again, what will we do? Try to justify ourselves? Figure out some clever way to interpret the story so that we can feel good about the limitations that we put on our love? Or will we really see what Jesus is trying to show us? That eternal life only comes when love has no limits. It's not just that limitless love leads to eternal life, it is eternal life. If we want to hold on to our limits, to only love in a safe, self-centered, self-serving way, then we don't really want eternal life. It'd be like a person saying, I want to learn how to swim, but I don't want to get into the water. Okay? It's all part of the same thing. Real life, living forever with God, means learning to love like God. If we're not interested in limitless love, we won't like heaven. We won't fit in. It won't be heaven to us. If we want to learn to swim, we better get used to water. If we want to inherit eternal life, we had better wade into the love of God. We better throw out our definitions of other and replace them with God's definition of neighbor. The process will be difficult. It will cost us. It will change us beyond recognition. But when we're talking about something like eternal life, what else would we expect? 
Let's pray. Lord, if we're honest with ourselves and with you, we have to admit that even a glimpse of your limitless love with no boundaries both thrills us and calls us, but also frightens us. Because we know that it'll cost almost everything we are. It'll require so much change and so much humility, so much death in a kind of way of who we are. But we ask that, again, you give us the grace and the courage to recognize that, yes, things will go away and things will change, but what you put in their place will be better, will be you, will be eternal life. Teach us how to love without limits. We ask it in your name. Amen. Let's go together to the Lord's table. Years ago, I was leading some art meditations around Scripture, and we were looking at this parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And you were supposed to listen to the parable and then draw something in response. Now, for a lot of people, that whole exercise makes them nervous because what do you say? I can't draw or the best I can do is stick figures, or whatever. But by the time we were done, I think the most powerful example, and they were all good, was stick figures. Here's what one woman drew. What do you see? She's labeled it, who is my neighbor? And then, through stick figures, she tries to work out the answer. This man has a needle. Is he a drug user? Is he sick? This woman has a bottle with three X's on it. That's kind of an old-fashioned way of showing alcohol, right? Is this this person suffering with alcoholism? This guy has a little can that says alms. He's on his knees. Is he poor? How about this person? Maybe someone in prison? Here are several people of different ages, genders, and races. How about this person? Is that a hijab? Is this a Muslim? How about this person here? What's happening with them? On one side they have short hair, one side they have long hair. One side they have a leg, the other side they have a wider, is that supposed to be a dress? Their face is divided in half. I think this is supposed to be a transgender person. Here we have the central question of Jesus' parable and a pretty good start toward many of the modern implications in stick figures. Don't tell me you don't know about art, okay? It's not about photorealism. It's about trying to find meaning through a medium. If we want to inherit eternal life, we better throw out our definition of other and replace it with God's definition of neighbor. God's definition of love. Can we really do what Jesus calls us to in this story and imagine our lives in someone else's situation? What if we were in that place? What love would we hope for? What love would we need from someone like us? Then come back into our own lives and say, that's who I'm going to be. That's how I'm going to live. That's what Jesus calls for. And we won't ever inherit eternal life until we're willing to learn that lesson. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your table today, we ask you to teach us once again the lesson of your love. We know that your love has made this table possible by giving of your life so that we might be whole. So teach us to not only fully receive your love, but learn to live it. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Join me then in the Lord's table. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after blessing God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he invited his disciples, as he invites us today, to come to his table and to do so in remembrance of him.